Hey everyone, uh, this is part two of the recorded lectures for uh, Tuesday. Please be sure to watch them all. I'm breaking them up both to make it kind of more digestible and um, to ensure that um, my computer doesn't crash after I've been talking for an hour. All right, um, and so uh, this uh, part of the lecture is about open domain question answering. And so uh, as we just saw with reading comprehension, we have a question and we have a passage and we want to find the span of text in that passage that answers the question. Uh, but in reality, um, you know, the main application of question answering is that we have a very large collection of documents like Wikipedia and we don't know where the answer is located. So we want to find the document in this massive collection of documents that answers our question. Um, and this is a much harder, but also a way more practical problem. And so, Breaking this problem down, we need a retriever to pull out a predefined number of passages which may contain the answer. And then we need a reader, uh, like the reading comprehension model that we just learned um, to apply to those passages to pull out the answer. And so traditional retrieval method, which was developed in 2009 is BM25. And BM25 matches keywords, adjusting for term frequency and document length. And so it can be seen as representing the question and the context in high dimensional sparse vector space with weighting. Um, and so we know that sparse vector methods, keyword methods are going to struggle with synonyms and with paraphrases. So who is the bad guy in? And then the answer is the villain is. And a sparse method um, based on term frequencies is not gonna understand that bad guy and villain are the same thing because they're not the same term, literally. And so it has been shown across a variety of contexts that if we jointly embed a query in a passage with a transformer language model, which is a full attentional approach, um, this will do a really good job at ranking the relevance of the retrieved documents. But we can't apply across encoder across a large knowledge base. You know, if every time you wanted to query Wikipedia, you had to jointly embed your query with the 12 million articles in Wikipedia and then index all of them, you know, that's gonna take even on a powerful GPU a really long time, right? Totally impractical. Um, and so the common approach um, was to use BM25 to rank documents according to similarity and then run a cross encoder over only the top thousand or hundred or so documents. Um, to um, then pull out the most likely one to have the answer. Uh, but the problem with this is that there's a strict upper bound on performance from any recall out errors in the first stage retrieval model. And so the recall error at 1000 for BM25 is um, 69.4. So like a third of the time, uh, the, um, the document with the answer is not in the top thousand retrieved passages by BM25. Um, and um, so obviously that's gonna be a limit to how well you can do with open domain retrieval. Okay, so this is what the full attentional approach looks like. You take your query, you take your document, you jointly embed them, and then at each layer of the transformer, you have full attention between everything. You have self-attention within the query, within the document, and full cross-attention. So everything in the query, all the tokens in the query, all the tokens in the document can all attend to each other at every layer of the transformer. So this is gonna give you an incredibly rich contextualized representation of your query and document that can with high accuracy tell you um, whether the document is likely to contain the answer to the query, but it's just too costly to run over more than a small handful of uh, query document combinations. Okay, so by leveraging pre-trained BERT and a dual encoder, um, the idea is that maybe instead of using BM25, we can train a neural model to produce dense vector representations, um, and that we can do that with a relatively small number of labeled question answer pairs. And so we can compute the similarity between our query and between our documents um, using um, a neural method and use that instead of BM25 for the first stage of our open domain retrieval. Um, and so in this case, the dense vector representations would need to be computed only once. No matter how many queries we use, we embed Wikipedia once, and then we embed our query each time and compute the similarity between the rep vector representation of our query and the vector representation of each of the documents in Wikipedia. 
Um, and, you know, initially it was thought that creating good, dense representations of documents would require a very large number of labeled question and answer pairs. Um, but like other examples that we've seen throughout this course, the self-supervised pre-training of BERT really helps um, to be able to create you know, pretty good document representations on a modest number of question and answer pairs. Um, because the language model through self-supervised pre-training has already learned a lot about language. And so a seminal paper in the space is DPR, uh, produced by Facebook AI Research in 2020. Uh, DPR uses a dense passage encoder, which maps any text passage to a 760-dimensional uh, vector. Um, at test time, DPR applies a different encoder, the query encoder, that maps the input question also to a 768-dimensional vector and retrieves the k passages whose vectors are closest to the query vector. And it defines the similarity between the query and the passage vectors uh, just using their inner product. And so they choose inner product similarity because it needs to be decomposable so that the representations for the passage can be pre-computed. You only um, compute the representations of Wikipedia once, and then all you need to do is embed your query um, and compute the similarity between the vector representation of your query and the vector representations of each of the passages. Um, and so they apply the passage encoder to all passages and index them using a method called Facebook AI Similarity Search, um, which is an extremely efficient open source library for similarity search and clustering of dense vectors. It can easily be applied to billions of vectors. So I mentioned last class uh, that when we use FAISS um, in our work on detecting which news articles came from the same underlying wire source, we were able to make 10 to the 14th vector similarity calculations with FAISS in three hours on a single GPU card. So this is a very, very, very optimized way um, to make vector similarity calculations. Um, and so this is what the buy encoder for retrieval looks like. You have a query, you embed it through your transformer, you have a document, you embed it through your transformer, and then you compute the similarity between your query and your document to retrieve the documents that are most likely to contain the answers to your query. Um, and so in training, the objective is to train the encoder so that the dot product similarity is a good ranking function for retrieval. So this is a metric learning problem. We want to learn a metric space where relevant pairs of questions and passages will have smaller distances than irrelevant ones. Um, and this space is determined by the embedding functions. So we train this by constructing instances where each instance consists of one question, one positive passage, so a passage that contains the answer, and n negative passages. And so this is just, this is trained using contrast of learning like we talked about um, many times already in the course. So there's different types of negatives. And remember from the contrast of learning lecture, um, it's gonna be important to have some hard negatives um, in order for the model be, to be able to learn well. So you could have just random negatives. You could have BM25 top passages that don't contain the answer. And so these are gonna be good hard negatives because they have lots of term overlap. They can ten, tend to contain the same words, but they don't actually answer the question. And then you also have gold positive passages paired with other questions in the mini batch. And this is very computationally efficient. And so your negative for one anchor is the positive for other anchors in your mini batch. Um, and yeah, this, this is a very computationally efficient approach. Um, and so DPR is trained with n-way cross entropy loss over the similarity scores between the query and the positive passage, one BM25 negative passages, and many in-batch negative passages. Um, which are the positive passages for other queries in the mini batch. And so you have this one hard negative and then you have these many other negatives that are in batch. Um, you know, we worked quite a lot with the DPR code base, um, but note that now it's quite outdated. Um, working with the expert code base, for instance, will give you a more modern implementation that's much more efficient of an asymmetric bi encoder architecture, which is what DPR is. All right. Um, so the model is trained on the, you know, the usual question answer data set. Squad actually isn't so great for this type of task because many questions lack context in the absence of the provided passage. And so the data set was created by presenting annotators with a Wikipedia passage and asking them to write a question that could be answered with it, but it might have no relation to like the rest of the Wikipedia page.
Um, and so this is their results, and you see BM25 at the top, and single is training with a single data set, and multi is training with multiple data sets, although none of them train on squad for the reasons I just mentioned. And you can see that they're really um, outperforming um, BM25 by a wide margin, especially on things that aren't squad, um, which has the problems um, that, I just, uh, that I just mentioned. Um, all right, um, exact match accuracy. Um, is, is, is less great, um, which is why typically you wouldn't do retrieval with just DPR. You would run, then run a cross encoder um, over the top uh, ranked documents, which then gives you this really rich cross attention. Um, but it has better recall than BM25 to get good candidates um, in there. Um, and so DPR, I think DPR has been very kind of influential for me in terms of how I thought about deep learning um, and approaching problems with deep learning, um, but it does have some potential disadvantages. Uh, the representations of a document are a single 760 dimensional vector. So everything in the document is put into this one vector. Um, there are no fine grained interactions as similarity is just the dot product between two vectors. Um, so this contrast to using a cross encoder Remember, which we saw kind of up here, there's, you know, all the tokens in the query and the document all attend to each other at every layer of the encoder. Um, and it also, by the way, contrasts to BM25, which is a, a term weighting model, you know, that's taking into account kind of essentially keywords. Um, and so very much it's about kind of matching exact terms. Um, and um, so we, we don't have this kind of term level representation with DPR, which just is one representation for a document. And so a potential kind of um, way to address this is contextualized late interaction, which is in a model called Colbert. Um, and so with Colbert, you still um, have separate encoders for your query in your document. So there are separate encoders. Um, and so you embed everything with your document coder and store it offline. So you embed Wikipedia once and then you embed your query with your query encoder. But with DPR, each document representation was stored as a vector, whereas with Colbert, we store it as a matrix. Um, and so instead of having a single vec vector representation that takes the class token or takes the um, average of all the token representations, you just store all the token representations as a matrix. Um, and then what you do is you go to the first token and you take the similarity kind of with each of the tokens in the query and take the max. And then you go do the same thing with the second token, similarity with each of the tokens in the query and take the max and you keep going. And then you sum up um, across um, all the terms. Um, and so this is gonna give you a way to have um, uh, cross attention, but only kind of at the very end. You only get this with the output tokens um, from the document encoder and the query encoder. You know, so unlike up here where you get attention, kind of cross attention at every uh, single layer of the transformer with late interaction, you know, hence the term late interaction, you get it at the end. All right. Um, and so what this does is to allow for some fine-grained interactions between tokens from the query and the passage. And so they show ex an example of this in the paper. When did the Transformers cartoon series come out? When in the query attends on in the passage, Transformers in the query attends the Transformers in the passage, cartoon in the query attends animated in the passage, and come out in the query attends to release in the passage. So you can see when we're looking at kind of the uh, the similarity between representations of specific terms, it is kind of um, giving us these, um, these very um, sort of uh, fine-grained interactions that make sense. The representation of when is most similar to the representation of on. The representation of cartoon is most similar to the representation of animated. The representation of comes out is, you know, most similar to the re representation of released, which is a synonym for comes out. So it makes a lot of sense what it's doing, and you can see why this would be helpful. Um, and they find that their model does almost as well as BERT, um, but is much like BERT with, you know, full cross attention, um, but is much less computationally intensive. All right. 
Um, so now I'm going to step back for a minute and ask, what is required for a retrieval? Um, so on the one hand, we might want to check for precise term overlap, like you know, we want there to be specific named entities in the query that appear in the passage that answers it. On the other hand, we also want to commute semant compute semantic similarity across related concepts, you know, so we care that comes out is another way to say released. Okay, and we know that keyword methods like BM25 will excel at the former because that's exactly what they do. They look for specific term overlap, um, whereas neural methods really excel at the latter. Um, and there's a recent paper by Luan et al. Uh, called hybrid retrieval, and they point out that there's some context where BM25 can outperform a transformer by encoder. Um, and you know we've worked quite a bit with the DPR code base, and we definitely found this to be the case um, for some queries. And at first we thought that there was a problem with our training or a bug in our code, and we realized no, actually this is just um, this is just an artifact um, of this type of model. Um, and this is BM25 is most likely to outperform DPR. Um, in context where the documents are long, so you're trying to shove more information into that single vector representation, or where the query requires precise detection of word overlap, right? Which is often the case in things like named entities, where we found that, um, you know, the DPR tend to, to sometimes struggle a little more. Um, and so they propose a very simple alternative, which is just to take a weighted average of the dense and the sparse similarity scores where the weight is learned on the validation set. And so you have a similarity score from DPR and you have a similarity score from BM25 and you just take a weighted average of those um, where you learn that weight um, on the validation set. And so if you have a data set where DPR is really great, um, you would put like a lot less weight on BM25. If DPR is not doing as well relative to BM25, you put more weight on it. And this is just like a very simple approach, um, but allows you to combine these two methods. Okay, another big, big area in this literature, as in much of deep learning, is self-supervised training, right? Um, and so the first sort of decade of deep learning focused, um, you know, in large part on supervised training, showed with supervised training we could beat human performance. Past few years, much of the focus has shifted to self-supervised training, um, you know, to get around some of the kind of really uh, severe domain shifts that occur with supervised training um, and the fact that we just don't always have labels to do what we want to do. And so there's been a lot of emphasis on the retrieval literature in uh, the past year or two on self-supervised training. Um, so this is one example called SPIDER. Um, and so the idea behind SPIDER is that you have a document um, and their example here is the page for Aaron in Wikipedia. Um, and they take two passages that contain a rep recurring span of text, which they call S, and one of them is transformed into a short query, which you see on the left. Um, they do that using a random window surrounding the span of text S, um, in which S is either kept or removed. Um, and the second passage is then considered the target for retrieval, while a random passage from the same document that does not contain that span of text is considered the negative. Um, and each batch is comprised of multiple such examples and the pre-training task is to select the, passage, the positive passage for each query from the passage of all examples, all the M batch negatives. They find that SPIDER is competitive with BM25, right? Which despite being kind of outperformed significantly by DPR is a pretty strong baseline. Moreover, a hybrid retriever over BM25 and SPIDER improves on both, um, which is very consistent with what we just saw about hybrid retrieval being potentially useful and is often competitive with DPR, um, which was trained on uh, thousands of supervised examples. Um, so it's not gonna beat DPR, um, but it can get pretty close with purely self-supervised training. And importantly, there's also notable gains from initializing supervised training with SPIDER. And this again is gonna be a theme and a theme as we move into applications that oftentimes, even if you have a supervised data set to train on, um, you might get better performance if there's a way to leverage self-supervised pre-training with your target uh, data as well. Um, so SPIDER is not the only approach. There's been a variety of approaches to self-supervised training um, of, of retrievers. So another approach is called uh, ART, 
Um, and it's essentially an autoencoding scheme. You take an input question and you use that to retrieve a set of passages, and the passages are then used to compute the probability of reconstructing the original question. All right, um, and so that is retrieval and open domain question answering. We saw uh, dense passage retrieval and how using an asymmetric bi-encoder um, to um, rank passages um, for their similarity to the query rather than BM25 can lead to better performance. Um, we saw um, late contextualized interaction and how that might allow for some contextualized interactions or how that does allow for contextualized interactions, but still allowing the re uh, retriever for the passage and the retriever for the question to be separate, uh, which is necessary computationally to be able to do open domain retrieval. Um, we saw that hybrid approaches where you combine BM25 and dense retrieval can potentially be helpful because they have different strengths and weaknesses. And we saw a couple of methods uh, for doing self-supervised training of retrievers, um, which you know could be useful for pre-training, even if you're going to do supervised training on your target domain. All right, so that's retrieval and open domain question answering. Um, and please be sure to go watch the third video for Tuesday's class, which is about retrieval augmented language modeling.